think as a starting point, um, I should say that most of the discussions on global governance that are taking place right now, including in key spaces like the United Nations, they tend to be a little bit depersonalized. They're very much focused on institutions. They often leave out not just individuals, but interpersonal relationships and communities. And finally, it often um, glosses over unequal power relationships or else deals with them in very abstract ways. So my understanding of the Pope's idea of um, the culture of encounter is very complementary to the debates that are taking place right now, especially at the United Nations, um, for three reasons at least. The first one is the focus on community. I think this is very important because once again, global governance debates about institutional reform, how to fill in the gaps, how to make the system more effective, they're often very detached from the local level. Secondly, I think another differential is the idea that this encounter is based on, um, I think the phrase he used was constant conviction that's expressed through action. And um, I very much like this call for praxis. Um, a lot of those debates tend to be um, at a very conceptual level. And of course we need the concepts, but translating them constantly into practice, I think is very much aligned with the secretary general's idea of, um, of a good fit, of fit for purpose, of effective practice based on sound concepts. And then finally, um, I think an aspect that I find very important in the Pope's approach is this idea of uh, tackling inequality and power asymmetries. Um, and he refers very explicitly to exploitation and abuse. Now institutions, they don't exist in a power vacuum. And in order to redress the gaps and the failure in, govern in global governance, you have to understand and address the deep-seated inequalities, as well as the new modalities of inequality that are shaping and reshaping these landscapes. So I think, again, um, the concept of the culture of encounter is, um, is very complementary, and in some instances may offer very useful corrections to the types of debates that are taking place at the global level. To me, whether we're speaking about the classroom or a think tank as in Plataforma Cipo or a negotiation table at the United Nations, um, encounter, to, to break it down, encounter to me means empathy and dialogue. Uh, it means finding common goals and working together towards those common goals, but also recognizing our common condition in humanity and really our indivisibility from nature. Whereas a, a culture of encounter more specifically, to me, it refers to the creation um, and the negotiation of norms, of practices that establish the conditions for encounters. So if I'm thinking, for instance, about our think tank, and we started this think tank at the very beginning of the pandemic, and highly uncertain settings, encountering all kinds of, um, um, not just uncertainties and challenges, but also disagreements about where we were heading and how should we, we, we should take on things. Um, we have to create a, a, an environment of openness, of tolerance, of willingness, not just to convince others, but also to be convinced sometimes. And at the same time, we have to temper this with a very firm heart in terms of curbing abuse and curbing exploitation. Um, and then I think finally, this uh, culture of encounter, when we put it into practice, really means fostering norms, right? So that's where the community meets the individual. It's about us developing shared ideas and ideals of, of peace, of well-being of sustainability as, as values, really. Now, I should say, and here too, I'm drawing from 
you know, our experience at CIPO, but also um, elsewhere in my work with the UN, our advocacy work, in the contemporary world, I think it's becoming more difficult for institutions to, to attain this type of culture of encounter. And part of this has to do with modern technologies, which on the one hand offer us um, amazing new tools for connectivity. This morning, I just participated in the conference on, on environmental peacekeeping, which in past editions, I was unable to attend um, because I'm here in Rio de Janeiro and these conferences tend to be held in um, the United States and in Europe. So they bring wonderful things, but they're also increasingly driving new wedges between us. And I'm referring here, of course, to the, to the um, fact that algorithms, they tend to prioritize radical viewpoints to the detriment of dialogue. And we see now here in Brazil uh, as well, not exclusively, of course, that some ex extreme ideologies that are based on a mistaken or misinterpretation of the idea of liberty as the freedom to do harm to others. Um, these, these ideologies have really taken advantage of these technological developments. And I don't think this is the only challenge we face, but when I think of the culture of encounter, this is a very big and growing uh, set of challenges that also affects uh, not just national level politics or community dynamics, but also even discussions of global governance reform. Well, we no doubt need to tackle this more systematically, but I think there are really interesting local uh, and some regional initiatives that from which we can draw inspiration. So for instance, here in Brazil, there are different groups, especially of youth, and among them, the mo among the most interesting ones are um, uh, Black Brazilian researchers who are looking, for instance, at how uh, hate speech and discriminatory uh, behavior is not just practiced, but in fact is encouraged by the way that these technologies are set up. And there is a discussion very much related to this research and advocacy around discrimination and new technologies that is looking at new forms of governance. How can we build effective, inclusive governance that will curb um, the um, tendency of these technologies to drive a wedge between us so that we can, we can derive benefits from the technologies but really minimize um, those very, very harmful impacts. And they're harmful at the level of communities. Um, they're harmful at the level of national politics. They affect electoral politics. They undermine democracy and human rights. And they're also harmful at the level of global governance. The UN, for instance, is suffering more than ever from discursive attacks, not just by national leaderships who are um, against multilateralism and uh, deniers of climate change and other major challenges, but who really seek to undermine the, the basic pillars for global solidarity. So uh, again, it's a massive undertaking, but there are amazing people, especially young ones who are working on this. I just need, I think it needs to be taken up in a more systematic manner and incorporated better into global governance. I think that on a daily basis, I, like most other people, are negotiating differences, whether you know, it relates to you know, our budget or um, you know, here at home, what my kids want for dinner. But when it comes to values and ideals, um, I can think of a particular example, which by coincidence, I just mentioned last night to two Colombian friends who came to have dinner here. Um, about four or five years ago, I was in Colombia, uh, in Caquetá, which is a region of Colombia that was very much affected by the FARC guerrilla and its uh, conflict with the Colombian government. And I was there as a part of a project to interview 
women combatants who during the project then became ex-combatants. And the first time that I went to Florencia, which is the capital of Caqueta, I hired a driver um, because I, I can't drive there, but also I would feel more comfortable, maybe more secure having someone who knew the terrain really well. And over the course of the, the travel, because I spent quite a bit of time there, uh, roaming around this province of Colombia, I talked to him a lot and it slowly emerged. He didn't let it out right away, but he, it slowly emerged that he was, he had been, he had spent many, many years in the army, deployed in Caqueta, hunting down FARC guerrillas. And here I was, I had hired him to drive me around so that I, can, I could go interview uh, the women combatants about the laying down of arms, which was uh, starting to take place at that period. And the, the, I remember very distinctly one time we went to a community that was being built by the, the, the ex FARC members. By that time, they had laid down their arms and the a peace agreement had been signed. And he stopped the car and he pointed to the to the, the, the entrance of the community where there's a tiny little bar, a very makeshift bar run by one of the combat, ex-combatants of the community. And he said, this is as far as I'll go. You can just walk, you know, about a kilometer. It's right there, you can see it. And I said, why don't you, you know, why don't you park there and wait for me? And I'm going to take a few hours. And he said, I don't want to get close to these people. And I went inside, you know, I came out after the interviews, he was still there, I walked all the way back. And this went on for a few times, but uh, maybe by the fifth time, I, as I was coming out of the interviews, I saw out of the corner of my eye, um, a scene which I'll never forget. He was sitting at a bar, at the bar, having a beer with a bartender. And so he was having a beer with, one of the people that he, as a soldier, was hunting down um, for more than a decade. And I can take no credit in this. You know, I think it was a process of realization. I also don't think it was necessarily a radical change of viewpoint. But to me, that was a moment that I witnessed in which someone who had a black and white antagonist saw the humanity in the other and was at least willing to engage in dialogue. That to me was an encounter in the sense that we're speaking of here. Um, I think it also speaks to the power of beer, but uh, the broader lesson of course, is that it is possible to engage in dialogue even when there are very deep divergences and even enormous resentment. And I think this is important, not just at the community level in Caqueta, but when we think about what we need to do with respect to global governance, to, for instance, mediate conflict, to prevent conflict, but more positively to foster a, a culture of peace and a culture of encounter that will lead to sustaining peace. You know, the first thing that comes to mind when I hear your question is a scene that I witnessed and was part of at the last conference of the parties, um, you know, the big climate conference, which was held in Glasgow. And we were very privileged to be able to attend, of course, because many Global South organizations were not uh, due to sanitary barriers, logistical uh, obstacles, you know, visa problems or, or scarce resources. And one thing that we notice is that at a negotiation space like COP, you have the formal table where the diplomats, uh, usually people in suits and more formal attire, they said they go through the rituals of diplomacy and they have pre-established expectations and ways that they negotiate. Um, and sometimes that can be a very interesting space, but in general, it's a very sterile environment. It's not all, always that exciting, right? Because of the pace and the need to maintain a certain tone. And then right outside that zone of COP, you have civil society space. And it's a brilliant manifestation of ideas, of passions, 
and of art. So there's a lot of art. There are movies, there are art, uh, there's art on the walls, there's graffiti, there are many different manifestations. And these are not two separate spheres. They think they 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 draw or they should draw on one another, maybe even more than they do now. But I think you know, when it comes to art, that to me exemplifies the way that encounters can happen around art and expression in ways that they don't always do in formal spaces, especially where participatory mechanisms are not fully institutionalized. Um, now, having said that, I wanted to make the point in response to your question, discussions of how to improve global governance, they have never been as important as they are now, whether we're talking about the COP, we're talking about Security Council, we're talking about prevention of conflict. Um, why is this? Because on top of all of the old challenges that we had, and most of them we did not manage to solve, we still have nuclear proliferation, we have armed conflict, we have geopolitical tensions rising right now as we are speaking. Um, we have new ones superimposed and interacting with these old challenges. So for instance, UNEP, the Environmental Program, increasingly refers to the idea of the triple threat of climate change, pollution, and contamination. And this is not a niche. This is something that interacts with everything else that is going on in the world. So, uh, and as I mentioned, of course, new technologies, they pose not just solutions, but also new problems, new ethical and moral issues as well. And I think this idea of culture of encounter um, may be very useful because it will help us, you know, those of us who are participating in discussions of global governance reform, of reform of the UN system, but others who should be taking part to ratchet down the level of analysis and of debate from that of institutions alone to that of people. And actually this is very common in UN messaging. They use the term people-centered approaches. The problem is that often the UN doesn't really know how to do this. And I think a lot of my colleagues at the UN would agree to this. They are at a loss when it comes to implementing responses, whether to climate change, security, um, humanitarian issues. Um, how do you center this on people and their experiences, their, their, their demands and their concerns, <clears throat> rather than focus on the troubleshooting of institutions alone? And then finally, um, I think there's a challenge that goes the other way, you know, the other direction. So the challenge I just described is how to ratchet down the level of discussion so that we um, reach not so much the individual, but communities, because I think it's the interaction that is more than the sum of its parts, right? But how do we also take the lessons learned from the culture of encounter, what works, the failures in encounter, the failures in fostering that culture, and we take it up. So to use the technical parlance of the United Nations, how do we improve the policy uptake and the feedback loops so that global governance uh, and its discussions of its own reform are not self-referential, but rather draw on the, the experiences of communities of interactions between people, uh, between um, cultures, between religions, and, and therefore not just enrich uh, those discussions, but render them much more effective. Because those two levels, the global and the local, either one is not enough by itself. They have to inform one another constantly. So I'll stop there, thank you. <laughs>